Hi everyone, welcome to the lecture on the project titled Symbiotic Relationships. Uh, what I'm going to do in the next uh, 45 minutes or so is to spend some time talking about the project. So it probably would be helpful for you to get that project description in front of you uh, on your computer, like whatever, um, and that will be found on Moodle, uh, titled Symbiotic Relationships. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is to um, talk about uh, the project generally, uh, give you the guidelines, and then also show you the work of about a dozen different artists uh, whose work um, relates to the subject of symbiotic relationships in some way. I don't know that they would necessarily be, uh, you know, describe their own work in such strong terms uh, relative to this assignment. It's not like they are making work that is specifically about symbiotic relationships, but certainly in the course of, you know, things that they are are doing, uh, the work can be seen through that light or can be seen in that context. And so we'll just go through, you know, using some of this as examples. Um, unlike other projects, if you were in my material space and meaning class, I tended to give you pretty strict parameters about projects and, and you know, give you boundaries within which you had to work. Sculpture functions in a different way, and you can see that, you know, in the bronze project that we just completed, and that rather than starting with boundaries, you start with ideas, and we develop ideas through a process. And this project is very similar. Uh, the idea that we're starting with here is not one of sort of casting in the history of bronze casting and responding to that history of bronze casting. This is much more about uh, relationships in nature and specifically symbiotic relationships. And so the materials for this project are, are completely open to you. You are going to have to sort of get some materials. We'll talk about that at the end of the, uh, the lecture here today. Um, but, but that's probably perhaps one of the more challenging things is you're going to have to get some materials and you're, you are going to be the driver to some degree in how you sort of collect things and work with things um, and, and solve the problem. So the first thing we need to do um, is we think about the project uh, is to maybe define a few terms for ourselves as we start to uh, think about this. And so the, the definitions which I have listed in the project descriptions, which can also be found, you know, there's more, uh, you know, clarification about that in the essay on symbiotic relationships in nature that's posted on Moodle. Please read that. That's one of the requirements for this assignment. It's a short read. It should just take you like seven or eight minutes. Um, but uh, in that particular essay, uh, they define uh, symbiotic relationships. And so there are symbiotic relationships in nature, uh, and this is a, a, a term that comes out of biology. This is not um, sort of an application of poetic values or ideas. This is really just a strictly sort of, you know, this is what nature does, and this is how they define it. Symbiotic relationships are those in which two or more creatures interact with each other for survival. Uh, and there are really uh, three major forms of symbiotic relationships that, are, that can be found in nature. Uh, the first is mutualism. Uh, and that is a situation in, in both creatures benefit from their interaction. I think the classic one uh, is that everyone seems to know about is sort of clownfish and the sea anemone where uh, the anemone provides protection, the clownfish, you know, uh, cleans, you know, the, the creature. Uh, and so they both benefit from those kinds of uh, relationships. And that is a, a form of symbiotic relationship called mutualism in which both of these are uh, benefiting from the interaction. Uh, there's another form called commensalism, uh, in which one, benef one creature benefits while the other is not affected. Uh, many examples of that uh, throughout nature, where the second creature actually could perhaps not even live without the first one, but the first one, you know, the first creature uh, provides the benefit with really no positive or negative impact, you know, on themselves. And then the third one, which is uh, parasitism, uh, I think we all can probably understand what that is, and that is one creature benefits while the other is harmed, like, you know, wood ticks or something like that, or, you know, different kind of parasites that, that I think we are all aware of. And so there are uh, many different forms of, uh, you know, well, these three different forms of, of symbiotic relationships become ideas for us, uh, become a way of thinking about visuality or, or, or um, you know, systems or, or I, you know, visual ideas. Um, that, that we're going to be exploring in this, but I am not asking you to necessarily make work that's about nature, okay? So I'm not asking you to like be carving sea anemones and things like that. I think that the project is, is broader than that, and what we're interested in is actually trying to think about relationships rather than nature, and so the, you know, using nature in this way is really just a lens to look through. 
the project description, um, you know, popping down a little bit on that paper on the, you know, the, um, the project description, it is an exploration of visual relationships based on ideas found in nature. Uh, to reiterate what I just said, uh, there's three basic parts to this. Um, first of it, which is to uh, read the brief essay. Uh, second is to watch this slide lecture uh, that we're doing today. And then third is to actually use your sketchbook to start drawing and rendering ideas. And uh, um, again, you know, the big idea as we're talking and, and discussing some of these, and I think you'll see as we go through a lot of the um, you know, a lot of the, the different examples that I'm going to be showing you that it's not necessarily, uh, you know, the subject doesn't have to be nature. Again, you're not, you don't necessarily have to be like, you know, carving wood ticks. Like it's not like that. It's more about uh, understanding relationships between different kinds of visual ideas. Um, the artist that we're looking at here, a uh, two-dimensional artist, I put him in the front just because uh, Bovey Lyons, uh, you know, we showed him at Bethel several years ago and I've always really uh, loved his work. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he kind of makes these lith litho prints and, and lots of other pieces in which he creates these fictionalized creatures that are kind of hybrids of you know, combinations of creatures that exist. You know, it's a, it's a bit of, they're a bit of a Frankenstein uh, approach to these, but I just thought it was a, a great image to uh, maybe start with. Um, as we think about sort of different types of relationships, some of which are sort of comfortable and some of which are not, I just think Bovey Lyon's work is uh, tremendously funny. And the way that he plays with kind of that, that uh, 19th century naturalism, you know, the people like Audubon and, you know, some of the other folks that, uh, you know, looked at the world and tried to figure out, <coughs> you know, different classifications uh, and different orders. So a good place to start as we start to wander down the path here. Uh, a better teacher actually would have had this uh, forms of symbiotic relationships. I would have had this slide up when I was talking about forms of symbiotic relationships, but uh, you folks seem to be stuck with me at this point in the class. And so uh, I'll just maybe toss that out there for a point of reference and we'll get into this next uh, slide as we uh, think about different kinds of relationships. And so rather than being super obvious about this, what I'll do is I will Maybe just start by showing you works like uh, this piece by Merritt Oppenheim. Merritt Oppenheim uh, was a surrealist um, and, uh, you know, did her work about, she was contemporaries with like Duchamp and Man Ray, uh, you know, early 20th century. Uh, and an important female artist, you know, at a time when, when contemporary art, you know, there was, you know, tremendous prejudice against, uh, you know, women, you know, uh, in that time. And so she was able to, you know, make a few works and was accepted somewhat, but she really just a, a pretty amazing figure. Uh, and this is probably one of her most iconic pieces that she ever made, simply titled Object. And uh, I, I love this piece. I think this is, um, you know, so uh, such a, a gorgeous, a beautiful, and, and also kind of arresting uh, image that would suggest, you know, like this weird relationship between, you know, this cup and this tosser, uh, which, which so much suggests this idea of, you know, high culture, or, or certainly, you know, somebody having a cup of tea, which is a very sort of classic and, you know, classy, you might say, uh, kind of activity, uh, and then covered with this animal fur, which is just so strange and guttural and visceral. And the idea of sort of you know, putting that spoon in your mouth is such an unsettling, uh, you know, an experience or, you know, it, it works on our imagination and our imagination in such strange ways. You know, and, and thinking about uh, symbiotic relationships, um, you know, the, this piece is really, it gets all of its energy from this very weird relationship, you know, between this, this saucer and this cup and the spoon. Uh, and this fur, uh, which is so, so strange. Is this, you know, sort of parasitism, mutualism? It's like, I don't, you know, it's, it's maybe hard to like sort out precisely what that might be. And I don't know that it's necessarily helpful to even sort of sort out what that be. But there's this really intense relationship between these two. Um, that's sort of gorgeous and wonderful uh, and strange uh, and also uh, kind of unsettling. So uh, another work 
by uh, Merritt Oppenheim, uh, another one on title, um, you know, that she would have had fabricated some of these, these two uh, teacups, which have been sort of put together. And I, I think this one actually does really kind of relate to, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, sort of mutualism, perhaps, uh, both, both benefiting from the, both creatures benefiting from their interaction. But there is a relationship between the two, which is interdependent and strong and very intense. Um, you know, which is a, a, a curious, you know, this, this curious object that uh, Merritt Oppenheim has created, which is um, both a kind of a symbol. It's, it reminds me a lot of like the way that a, an ovum or an egg will sort of separate after it's fertilized or even just like a single cell will kind of, you know, split itself into two. Um, and at, again, at the same time, a sort of highbrow and high culture and all of that and also speaking really towards this intense kind of biology which does be kind of a, a theme in Merritt Oppenheim's work uh, which you can see here so the uh, uh which is a German word for fur gloves um, by the way, these are sort of all probably like wax or plastic fingertips in there. But again, all of her work seems to explore or to poke around with this idea of, of uh, you know, high society. Um, and, and yet we are, you know, sort of creatures, you know, we're, we're animals at heart. Uh, and this is one of the things that the surrealists, I mentioned that she was one of the surrealists. This is one of the things that the surrealists were very interested in, was the way that the veneer of civilization is sort of just barely kind of covering over, um, you know, that are animal instincts that are underneath. If you sort of remember psychology or if you have any awareness of, at all of that, you will sort of realize that this is about the time that Freud's ideas about the, the subconscious and the id and the ego and the superego are being formulated and really disseminated to the larger culture. And uh, the surrealists were very interested in this, you know, the idea that underneath, um, you know, underneath our conscious lives, you know, we're just sort of barely holding this together, barely holding these forces back. Um, you know, there's this id underneath, which is just all about sort of money and sex and power and, you know, grab and feeding and eating and reproduction and all of that. And so Merritt Oppenheim is all about, you know, this tension back and forth between sort of like these civilized and uncivilized uh, relationships. Uh, civilized or, or uncivilized urges, you know, sort of super ego and id uh, kind of urges. And so in in that sense, I think like that really sharp tension in her work is a lot about sort of, you know, mutual, you know, there's, there's like mutual tensions there, like one sort of depends on the other in a way. So, um, so we're going to press on. Uh, I wonder if you folks can hear, um, maybe, you know, you can hear my neighbor in the back who's out there with his riding mower uh, right now, back and forth. Um, Clean in the yard. Well, my yard looks looks terrible, but that's kind of what's going on. So if you hear a bit of a mower going on, well, that's just the ambiance of suburbia that's going on right now. Uh, the next. These two pieces, you know, the, the accumulation piece and then this. Uh, this other one are very much about this idea of you know parasitism or something being overwhelmed or trans you know completely transforming an object by you know, kind of this application of, of energy and image and object. Um, so uh, maybe something to think about as you as you are thinking uh, about potential solutions or objects to work on. Uh, Nick Cave, who actually um, uses a lot of, <coughs> he came out of the fiber world, you know, uh, so he came through sculpture, um, you know, by way of sort of fiber arts, which is great, you know, terrific artist, and his work often will uh, include um, you know, elements that make sound or elements that have sound or sound itself. So he has, you know, done a number of pieces like this. And by the way, what you're looking at is a hand knitted suit. And so this thing, there are sort of photos with him, uh, you know, different individuals that are actually wearing these things uh, and sort of walking around and they just make like crazy amounts of noise. And so they're just completely obsessive and sort of gorgeous and wonderful. Uh, and I also think too about this idea of, of mutualism and <laughs> 
commensalism or parasitism, or this symbiotic relationship. Let's maybe from now on just talk about symbiotic relationships. You know, this symbiotic relationship, you know, is this, is sort of the guy wearing the structure or is the structure wearing the guy? Uh, they are really kind of, there's a back and forth here, which is uh, not easy to, to uh, maybe pull apart. Um, but the the way that, uh, you know, the, the, the degree of excess and just this insane kind of ornamentation that Nick Cave, you know, demonstrates in his work and, and puts in his work is very much, uh, you know, about sort of overwhelming or very much about sort of this additive quality where you keep adding and adding and adding. Um, and, and you start to create, you know, this intense interaction or this intense kind of symbiotic relationship between the clothing and the individual to the point where the individual is kind of lost, you know, in a, in a piece like this, the individual here is actually almost completely overwhelmed by the, you know, the qualities of what's, what's happening or, or what's going on, um, you know, in, in the work. So, uh, uh Final one by uh, Nick Cave. Uh, the one in the center. Um, let's see. The one. Maybe it's. Uh, maybe I don't have a picture. The, he. He. You know. He, one of the pieces that he did that I actually had saw at one point was one where you know those noisemakers that that you can sort of whip around in a circle. Uh, you know, he had a suit made out of those. But you know, the the suits are so much about sort of excess and and so much about um, you know just like. Uh, you know, just keep adding things and creating those relationships so that people, you know, if we think about our relationship with our clothing, which is actually kind of symbiotic in a way, you know, because we, you know, the clothing that we wear is really, it doesn't have any value or meaning without us. And I think most of us don't want to go around without clothing. And so there's a bit of a symbiotic relationship that we have even with our clothing. And I like how he is exploring that in a very sculptural sense and, and pushing it very hard to this, to this aspect of transforming, you know, to like transform what's going on or transforming the individual uh, these crazy crazy suits which are just so excessive and over the top and and playful you know uh, and one of the things you know when we some of these pieces we're looking at the symbiotic relationship you know can actually be kind of dark you know where the where one element is being perhaps overwhelmed uh, and I don't necessarily get that vibe or that sense from Nick Cave's work which this in which the symbiotic relationship is one of pleasure or you know a person sort of being overwhelmed by you know intense patternation or being overwhelmed by intense sort of uh, sound or color or um, you know these delightful structures uh, and so these even sort of like the paras parasitism you know which might be a bit evident and or or a bit apparent or maybe a theme that goes in his work is not necessarily an unpleasant one you know that would that would usually be experienced but you know one's one you know way of thinking or one visual idea sort of overwhelming another doesn't have to be <coughs> necessarily a negative thing. So. Uh, our next artist, uh, Peta Coin, is definitely worth another look. And by the way, all of these artists that I'm showing you are are well known. And all of these, as you're thinking about oral presentations coming up, they would be uh, really good candidates for oral presentations. So absolutely, you know, feel free. Uh, to choose these folks, but they all would be worth, you know, another look or two. Uh, Peta Coyne's work, she's a, a British artist, a little bit older, um, you know, probably in her 60s by now. Uh, but uh, her, throughout the course of her career, she has worked with natural media, natural objects. And so the things that you're seeing here, like the feathers here are, are sort of real feathers, you know, for the most part. Uh, she will often use artificial feathers also, but as we're going forth, these like the next one that we're going to see, like those are real creatures that we're, we're looking at. So, um, and thinking about symbiotic relationships with Petacoin's work, uh, it becomes again, perhaps a bit more, um, you know, it's not as obvious as sort of like representing, you know, it's like a sea anemone and a clownfish. No, it's like it's more about sort of interactive relationships. And, and what are those like? And sometimes even in the in the midst of a single work, uh, I, I, you know, the piece that we're looking at, I just have really taken with this bell jar with this object sort of over the top. Uh, is it trying to take it over? Why are these two isolated? If you take away either one of those, you know, the, the piece is greatly diminished. Uh, but there's a tension and there's a, an interaction 
between sort of the white and the black element and the sense of barrier between them with the bell jar, uh, which is just such a strange and wonderful tension. You know, if you take away the white, take away the black, you know, nobody cares about this thing. But that the tension between them uh, suggests a very strong, you know, kind of symbiotic relationship or, or dualistic relationship uh, between them. Uh, this is perhaps more typical of some of uh, Petacoin's work. Uh, she's making large installations. You know, those would be real peacocks. A lot of the where she she gets her uh, animal creatures are when uh, muse museums. You know, they'll decommission things, and so she purchases uh, you know sort of creatures from these de you know um, you know decommissioned pieces from museums and and other places like that. So she's not sort of harvesting these herself. At least that's my understanding. Uh, but but it's very important for her that she's actually using the real creatures, you know, rather than, um, you know, it, it, in addition, like often there are sort of artificial elements as well, but she's not afraid to kind of get in there and use like those actual creatures. And so a piece like this, which, um, you know, deals with very directly with natural kind of phenomenon, uh, you know, identifiable things, um, you know, it's like trees and birds and those things in the bottom, which are less identifiable. Um, I, again, I would say that it's this one that would be hard for me. It's like the previous one, you know, there's very definitely a, a relationship back and forth uh, that's interactive and symbiotic that either one of those things is removed and the, the piece really just doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, where this one, I, I actually have a harder time kind of trying to sort out where, you know, mutualism or commensalism or parasitism, you know, might be evident here. Or maybe I would say that all three seem to be sort of interactive. This is very definitely a piece about sort of interactive aspects of, of, you know, these natural phenomena, these creatures, this natural world, you know, life and death. You know, for me, like the, the most apparent sort of visual imagery or iconography that's happening here is sort of about life and death. You know, it's like these, these um, uh, you know, the peacocks, which are vertical and sort of gorgeous and beautiful and wonderful. And then you have this other, these other creatures who are inverted, uh, you know, black, gray, dark, uh, you know, obviously hanging, you know, by some, you know, by some you know, nefarious ends, they have, they have gotten to some nefarious ends somehow. Um, and so the interaction of this piece, all hanging on like this really weird tree, you know, which is, is this become a symbolic tree of life? Is this, is this become a hanging tree? Is this become like the executioner's tree? It's like, what is, what is this about? And so rather than, than, um, you know, making a, a super di direct statement, I think perhaps a better idea to, or a better way to explore ideas as artists is to be thinking instead about this notion of, of experiences, that artists make experiences for other people. And part of those experiences are often about ambiguity, or part of those experiences are often about, um, you know, just uh, allowing things to happen simultaneously. So there are symbiotic relationships here, but it's not necessarily distilled down as neatly as the previous one of hers that we were just looking at. Likewise, this, I wanted to show uh, another one. A lot of her works are actually hanging pieces uh, where she will, um, you know, and they're, they're very large too, by the way. This, so this piece of, you know, peacock like that's like four and a half, five feet long. So this piece sort of hanging down uh, and she makes these uh, large, gorgeous pieces uh, with just like tons and tons of tons of imagery and plastic flowers and, you know, like feathers and, you know, natural forms, like all of this stuff. A lot of times she will dip them in wax. And so they have this really kind of super lustrous coating of wax on them. Maybe I'll just jump ahead to the next slide where we can see that. Um, you know, this is actually a bit more typical, uh, again, of her work, which is so much about this, you know, sort of lustrous, you know, coating and, and these gigantic pieces that hang from the ceiling, just these huge accumulations of form uh, that build up. They're just, uh, you know, these, these kind of monstrous uh, accumulations. They're super Baroque. You know, Baroque is, <coughs> Baroque art is art in which uh, it's like theme and variation, like Beethoven, you know, Bach, and like, those are Baroque artists, because what they do is they start with a theme and then they just develop it over and over and over again in, in a multiplicity of directions. And Petticone is very much kind of a Baroque artist, you know, taking a particular theme and just developing it again and again and again, uh, and just allowing the accumulation of these things to really 
um, you know, sort of overwhelm us to some degrees. These things are, are you know, monstrously heavy, seven, 800 pounds probably, uh, you know, hanging from the ceiling um, and just super imposing. I've had an opportunity to see several in my life and they're just like astonishingly kind of imposing uh, in the way that they, uh, they sort of overwhelm. And again, uh, often about symbiotic relationships, you know, and this one, again, the back and forth between this, this structure on the left, the structure on the right, um, you know, it's not necessarily maybe as clear, you know, often when, if we start to imagine solutions to this, you know, to this problem that I'm giving you of symbiotic relationships, we might imagine like very didactic or direct things like sea anemones and clownfish, right? Okay. That's really obvious. And so maybe what we need to do, like we did with the bronze castings is get into a situation where you are um, developing ideas rather than trying to imagine solutions beforehand and working toward that. And this is definitely what Petacoin does in her work as she sort of develops and builds and builds uh, over time. Very much like our next artist, who is Diana El Hadid, who is a, uh, an American artist. Uh, Petacoin, I believe, is British, but uh, Diana El Hadid is. Um, an American artist, uh, probably in her early 40s by now, um, over the course of her career, has, she has started making these larger structures. Again, this is very big. Uh, I'm guessing 15, 18, 20 feet wide easily. Uh, the figure that you're seeing, like on the, uh, you know, the central figure, those are probably close to life size. Um, and so that gives you a, an indication of the scale. Um, Diana Hel Adid, you know, like Petacoin, like, you know, Yayoi Kusama uh, that we've looked at already, is another artist who works in a multiplicity of directions. I've focused a bit more tightly on a couple different directions uh, that she has done here. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, maybe a, a quality about her work that fascinates me is the relationship of the figure to these architectural kind of situations. You know, so this piece, uh, the, the Nall's Orders, uh, you know, she's working here in what's called resin, which is a, um, like, you know, they make bowling balls out of resin. Okay. So like it's a liquid that they pour into a mold and it becomes solid, very, very tough once it hardens. And so uh, you're looking at the strata here, uh, you know, so these figures would be sort of cast resin and she like does a lot of things with sort of dripping and collapsing. So the figures, it's like, we're looking through time or we're looking through, um, you know, both time and space simultaneously. Uh, she just sort of loves these classical images. And in terms of like symbiotic relationships, I, you know, I'm just really drawn to the way that, uh, you know, like the, the figure and the ground become really uh, connected to each other. Um, you know, one of the things that you, you see if you ever start to do like figure ground, like figure painting, uh, not finger painting, figure like painting the figure uh, is that... Um, Everybody always sort of focuses on the figure, which is natural, but like the ground, man, the stuff around it, that's where uh, those things often succeed or fail. Is, uh, you know, back when I used to teach a lot of drawing, I would get people that would like try to draw their friends and they would bring me a drawing and it's like their dread is, you know, friend is like sort of exquisitely rendered with just like acres of white space around them. I'd say, Ken, what's wrong with this drawing? I'd say, man, you got to draw something around it, you know, because people don't exist in a void. You know, people exist in, in real environments. And I think that that what Diana El Hadid is talking about in her pieces or demonstrating in her pieces is the fact that that humans are part of a culture. You know, humans are always connected to a physical environment which has layers and layers and layers of history. Uh, her own personal background is uh, Syrian. Uh, when she was a kid, uh, she was born in Syria. Her, when she was young, her parents emigrated to Cleveland, I believe. Uh, if you know anything about Syria, Syria is absolutely a country with you know, tremendous amounts of history, but it's also undergoing a, a civil war right now. It has been for a long time, uh, really uh, some very difficult things. And you find echoes of that, you know, the ideas of history and, and um, layers of history or things being repeated, uh, kind of showing up in her work a bit. So. This is perhaps a, a project, that, a work right here that, that reflects a bit more about into the idea of, of symbiotic relationships where we have this figure. I love how this central figure on this pedestal, I mean, how many times have we seen a figure on a pedestal, right? And uh, it's the pedestal is always perfect. The pedestal is always pristine. Uh, we see the figure atop it, um, you know, and the pedestal kind of goes away. But one of the things that I love is that Diana El Hadid's work, uh, the figure in the ground is they merge into each other. They be they become one. Um, 
um, and there's a relationship here that's far more fluid, you know, and she's talking perhaps more about how we are. I, I think what she's talking more about is how we're much more a product of our environment or like physically connected to our environment more than we might um, typically suggest or, or often think about, especially, you know, Christians in the West, especially evangelical Christians. Uh, we tend to sort of remove ourselves from, um, you know, uh, participation, participation in history, you know, like local history, larger human cultural history, but even like the physical world. And we, you know, like the song used to say when I was a kid, the world is not my home, you know, and, and uh, I, which I don't, I think is bad theology, by the way, um, but um but the Anna Hadid is really talks about like the physical relationships of, of people to their environment. I just love the way that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, this figure is kind of seeping into this pedestal. The pedestal itself is kind of dissolving in front of our eyes. And there's a fluidity here. There's a, a, a sense of evaporation or, or things that seem solid, not actually being solid, uh, which is something that I, I think is quite wonderful. Like, what is this? Is this mutualism? Is this parasitism? Is this uh, commensalism? Like, I don't, you know, I think I could make a case for a couple of different things, but maybe what I would say is like the, the symbiotic relationship between these two is really powerful. You know, it's like they, they be, they're two halves uh, of, a, of a whole, uh, and the whole depends on both halves, you know, of the experience kind of being there. Similarly with this uh, other work, and I really wanted to show you folks this one because this is cast bronze. Uh, cast bronze, and I'm guessing either a limestone or a, a concrete base. Uh, and so those of you that have cast bronze, you know exactly how this piece is made, right? So you take the wax, you let the wax pour off the edge of the table, then you take that thing that's poured off and you cast that thing. Uh, and you all know this because he just did this. Uh, I love that. Isn't it? And it's such a simple gesture too, right? It's like you, like really everybody that just went through my bronze casting, your, you know, your bronze casting assignment um, could make this piece. This is not a super technical piece, but again, you know, this relationship, this figure that's literally kind of melting in front of us, this, this figure that's, that's literally sort of, you know, becoming part of the environment uh, in front of us is just so sort of gorgeous and wonderful and so much about this sort of strange uh, symbiotic relationship. It's like she's sort of leaking back into history or, or you know, pedestals, especially pedestals out in, in communities or in, you know, the, in front of the library, in front of the state house, whatever, so much about history, remembering history. And I like how this one is actually, I think a lot about forgetting history. You know, it's like, um, you know, things that are going to be forgotten, you know, especially, you know, in this case, uh, you know, this, this female figure. So. Uh, another work, you know, I think I've already kind of covered it, Deanna Al Hadid, but I just love her work so much uh, that I take every chance that I get to to show another piece or two. Loving the strata, uh, loving what she has done, just the, the gorgeous sense of texture and and uh, visuality and layer and color and all of that stuff, which is just uh, so wonderful. So definitely worth a, a read. Um, In this previous one, looks even weirder for being so pristine. These mushrooms become sort of more gorgeous for being in the white space, and so there's a relationship between uh, those two, which is uh, which is quite wonderful. Um, other pieces that uh, that of Roxy Payne's that play around with nature. This piece called Conjoined. Um, he's done a number of these tree structures. Uh, this is the one that's perhaps the most directly applicable to some ideas that we're considering today. Uh, stainless steel. He makes these stainless steel trees, which. Um, which are not really trees and <laughs> they're not really not trees. Uh, the way that he fabricates them, they're kind of artificial. They're not quite real. Uh, the, the, we have looked at Roxy Payne a little bit already uh, because he does sort of cast those tendrils of the tree. But in this one, if you look at the conjoined, you have these two structures that are, um, you know, these tree structures that reach across toward each other and they're actually touched. They're actually welded together so they become fused. in this experience. <clears throat> 
Um, and, and I love the way that this is so simultaneously kind of wonderful and freakish, you know, and, which is a space that, that Roxy Payne tries to explore a lot. It's this idea of nature. And he would, I mentioned, I think the other day when we were talking that Roxy Payne's work uh, has really caught, allowed me to kind of think about nature in a very different way, you know, because uh, his work is so much about what you might call post, uh, sort of like a post-Western natural uh, perception. It's like he doesn't really kind of see nature as, you know, humans as being as separate from nature, but he thinks about nature, you know, us being integrated with it uh, by, you know, and, and he just sort of plays with this idea of what's, what's natural, quote unquote natural, and what's not, you know, and um, definitely sort of pushes the boundaries of that or explores this middle ground between what's natural and, and what would be considered artificial. Um, and in any case, uh, you know, the, um, you know, like this one in particular, thinking about uh, symbiotic relationships, you know, I just love the weirdness of this, you know, the fact that this feels like it belongs in the movie like Annihilation. If you haven't seen that, it's a fantastic movie about, about it's like, uh, nature gone explosively awry in this really subtle ways. But um, I just love the way that these, these, these two creatures of these trees kind of coming alive and reaching across to each other. So hope You're getting a sense now of, you know, some of the possibilities, um, some of the, the ways of thinking about, you know, this project, that this is uh, not uh, necessarily about, um, you know, nature in a specific way, but it's about sort of relationships and thinking about visual relationships. Uh, Tadashi Kawamata, you know, I think I might have... Um, I have uh, a couple of pieces by Tadashi Kawamata, who's a, a Japanese artist um, who works a lot in architecture and, uh, you know, occasionally deconstructing architecture. Um, this is one, I believe those are just pallets, you know, and how many times have we seen, you know, a pile of pallets next to, a, uh, you know, a building. And I just love the way that, that uh, Kawamata in this particular instance allows them to kind of you know, overwhelm the building, start to climb up. They, it's, it's almost like, you know, lightning has struck, you know, they've been bitten by the radioactive spider and now they have come to life, you know, they're kind of overwhelming it. Um, and I just think it's a really great visual relationship between these two. It's very delightful, very fun. Um, but is this parasitic? I think it kind of feels a little parasitic. Maybe it's mutualism. I don't know. But, you know, there's some really fun kind of interactions between, you know, these these temporary structures and kind of overwhelming this, uh, you know, this uh, this other sort of more staid sort of classic building. Um, and it, other Uh, in this particular one, um, you know, really my understanding of this was that uh, Kawamata really just disassembled this structure that was here and then reassembled it like this. So rather than having sort of this classical architecture, you know, he deconstructed it and turned this, this staid, static, formal, uh, you know, very stable structure into this other kind of vortex uh, experience. Which is really wonderful, you know. It's just such a great idea. <clears throat> and by the way, I, w I might suggest too that this is not necessarily, you know, only something that could work, you know, on a large scale. You don't need an epic scale to sort of deconstruct something and reconstruct it again, you know, in a different kind of way. I mean, this would work on a micro scale as well. You know, if you take something, you know, it's like I don't know. I'm looking around my studio here trying to find something it's like, you know, suitcase, you know. Um, you know, power tools like, you know, trash can, like, like, I think that there's a lot of things that would allow themselves to be deconstructed and reassembled that, that would do this in some really sort of wonderful ways. So. Uh, the relationship between, you know, the, the, the product that he has created and the, um, you know, the, the previous one, I just love that transition. Has it now become parasitism, you know, some mutualism? I don't know. Is the, is the key interaction between the past and the present, is it about um, what we remembered relative to what's showing up here? I think that's a really charged relationship. It's also just a charged relationship between, you know, this kind of whirling vortex and, and I said, like this really staid uh, and static uh, architecture that's behind it. This is a powerful relationship. 
And hopefully your understanding here as I'm talking and riffing on, on a few of these artworks uh, as we go through, that art is, you know, often the way that we teach art sort of early in a person's career, it's much more about statement, statement, statement. You know, what are you saying? What do you have to say? Um, and as you start to make more and more work, you realize that that art is development. It's like you develop ideas into these really compelling experiences. Statements are different than experiences. There's absolutely a place for statements, but experiences that are developed like this, which are more subtle, which are perhaps more um, engaging, uh, which are perhaps more, um, hmm, how do I talk about that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, well, you'll probably get it. You know, it's like developing an idea of, you know, so that you develop something that you discover as opposed to seeing something that you want to say. They're both valid experiences, but more often uh, the statements tend to have a bit of a shelf life. And a piece like Tadashi Kawamata's, you know, this particular work is much more about sort of this gorgeous experience that, that is kind of nonverbal, um, that is more nonverbal and allows us to sort of dwell with this and think about it in, in very different ways. Uh, another series of pieces that uh, Tadashi Kawamata um, has done is, uh, you know, kind of these crazy tree houses. I wish we could occupy them. <laughs> I wish you could get up there and hang out in them, but you can't. They're really just for uh, looks alone. But this, if you look behind you here, you see that this is actually a piece that he did in Central Park. And so that penthouse that's behind this is probably like a $5 million penthouse. Uh, and I love, just love the fact that, you know, he's kind of, um, you know, making a contrast between these two. I don't think this is like social critique or economic critique or anything. Uh, maybe, okay, so maybe there's some of that there. But I think this is really just a lot about, um, you know, Kawamata talking about, you know, dwelling. And when I think about sort of myself dwelling in this tree structure, suddenly I have a, a stronger kinship with creatures, you know, like birds. Um, and there's, there's a relationship there that I think is really um, kind of wonderful and something that he's putting before us to consider. You know, uh, I like kind of the randomness of, you know, that platform that's underneath there. <clears throat> you know, my neighbor who recently built a, a tree house about this size, um, you know, just down the road from me, you know, he built it in the way that Americans built things, you know, which is straight and square and flat and all of that. It's not nearly as interesting as uh, Tadashi Kawamata's. Bless my neighbor. I really think that the tree house he built is fun. But, you know, this one, uh, Kawamata's work is so much about the way that, like, birds build, you know, or, you know, any creature that builds nests, you know, like the way that they build nests. Um, and so there's a relationship here, you know, we want to think about mutualism here. Um, you know, I think this is, this is a piece that's kind of specifically about sort of mutualism, you know, that both creatures are kind of benefit or benefiting, or at least this is, this is not necessarily a parasitic relationship here. This is one that is perhaps calling for, um, um, you know, a, a sensitivity towards the other one. Okay, so this is funny because, um, so I'm here, my neighbor is desperate, he's a retired gentleman, very nice guy, but he's desperately trying to finish his lawn and it is absolutely pouring out there right now. I mean, it's like pouring, pouring, like, uh, you know, the kind of this rainy snow, sleety stuff. And he's out there just making the last little round around his garage, trying to finish up. So good for him. Uh, next artist we're going to look at, um, Andrea Zettel. Dang, I really wish that I had um, put a few more of her images in here, but I think she's definitely worth uh, looking at a bit more. She would actually be a great artist for, for anyone in the class that might be interested in things like fashion or you know clothing or things like that. Uh, Andrea Zettel has done a number of projects over the years, <clears throat> which is really about kind of reimagining our role in the you know, our role relative to our place in the earth. And so one of the things that she's done is she creates these little environments that very much are about a symbiotic relationship or a mutualistic relationship with the environment. And so you, these, like what you're looking at here are, are little habitats that you can actually like check out and go to and, and hang out in, um, you know, spend the night there, which I think would be super fun. Um, and so she creates these structures. Some of these structures that she's created, you know, are about floating, but they're all very much about a relationship to the natural world, uh, which is much more, 
much more attuned, much closer to it, much more in a, a, a holistic. Maybe I would say that they're that the that the pieces are kind of aspirationally mutualistic, um, and that she hopes that there would be you know a relationship there. Um, that would be beneficial, uh, you know, to both individuals. So other things that she has done in the arc of her career and dang, I'm kicking myself for not sticking those in here. Um, she has done pieces where she has, uh, you know, like she, she will knit her, like her make her own clothing often by knitting uh, and then wear that piece of clothing. I mean, they're really sort of beautiful and highly durable and really functional, but she'll wear that for like six months. And it's like, that's the only thing that she wears. And it, it becomes a way of thinking about, you know, um, like the fashion industry and, and what that's about and, and uh, uh, you know, just creating a, a different relationship to clothing and appearance. And, uh, um, you know, so I think that there are questions there that she's asking that are about relationships, like I said, to environment, relationships to clothing, relationships to, you know, industries, like I said, like, <coughs> excuse me, like fashion and so on. Um, so definitely, if you're interested in that, I would, I would suggest you go uh, take a look at that. And the reason that I may be emphasizing this a bit more is often, you know, people in the class, one of the things that, that they have done in their lives is, you know, so they make clothing, they've knitted things. Um, and it's like, I think that's really terrific to be able to pull that into, you know, a sculpture class and use that rather than saying, no, that's craft. You can't. I think Andrea Zatel is a de is demonstration of an artist who's done a terrific job of, you know, like pulling things in from these, you know, these other ways of making, you could say, um, that have typically not been as strongly associated as, as sculptural. So uh, definitely worth a look. But we're going to pop on to the next artist. Here, which is uh, Henrique Oliveira. Uh, he's a Brazilian artist. I actually had a couple of these folks I have had the opportunity to meet and to talk to, and, and Henrique was one of those. I interviewed him for a book that I was working on, um, and so I got to know him pretty well. And so, you know, I think he's a natural fit for this kind of uh, experience because of the, this kind of project and this idea about mutualism in particular because his work, uh, what you're looking at right here is actually the inside of a gallery. The gallery had these kind of posts in it. And so Henry went in and he like added all of these crazy, you know, branchy kind of structures. Uh, so he's got a big space down in uh, uh, Sao Paulo uh, and he makes these things. And then he, you know, he and his crew would go, you know, show up at the gallery. Um, and then install these. It takes several weeks to install these large installations. But very much like uh, Roxy Payne, you know, he sees the, you know, the pristine white gallery as a bit of an adversary. You know, he, you know, the Roxy Payne who did the mushroom pieces in the gallery floor. Uh, you know, Henrik Oliveira kind of sees, you know, he, he start, tries to create a relationship with his work, with the gallery, the pristine white gallery spaces in a way that's actually kind of adversarial, you know, in a way that, um, is a, a little bit uncomfortable. So, you know, we can see here that the gallery itself is kind of turning, you know, back into, into this natural form. It's, this is actually, you know, uh, perhaps even a bit surrealist in a way, you know, the, the gallery come to life, like in a, in a science fiction or a horror movie or something. Um, but everything that you're seeing here, the gallery walls, he doesn't, he very seldom like actually uh, puts, you know, hangs things on walls, but he transforms the gallery spaces. Uh, I came across this one uh, that he did, which I had never seen before, uh, definitely wanted to include it. Uh, and so the, the forms that he's making, he would have started with the, the tables and then added these other forms, um, you know, these bulbous forms. And when I interviewed him a while back and I was talking about like the sources of his, like his visual imagery, he told me that he actually, he has a couple of books on like skin diseases and tumors and things like that, uh, that he uses a lot to kind of get visual imagery and iconography to play around with. And it's very evident here. Uh, but again, you know, this, this terrific tension between, you know, this, these refined forms and then these other sort of bulbous things that are kind of taking it over or turning it back into this other kind of, uh, you know, natural experience. Uh, so this is perhaps a newer direction for Henrique, and this is uh, a bit more 
uh, typical of, of what he does where he transforms galleries by adding these structures and, and looks as though nature is coming back to take, you know, it's like nature's back with a vengeance, you know, going to take over uh, everything. Uh, and and uh, so this would be, you know, much more typical of Henrik's work. Uh, and again, the, the, the relationship, <coughs> excuse me, uh, parasitic, mutualistic, you know, par you know um, commensalism, like, I don't know, but it, it's very much about sort of transforming the gallery space uh, and transforming, uh, you know, creating a relationship. So this piece gets its energy by transforming the space, uh, kind of reinvigorates it. And and for Henrik, actually, what one of the things he's kind of talking about here, I think, is is um, you know he he maybe has a I would he's not an angry guy or anything, but I think he's kind of poking at this idea of you know the conventions of the gallery space. Like why is that so pristine? And and he wants to maybe hold up a mirror to that and and talk about like how gallery spaces are kind of strange and they're even maybe kind of elitist. You know, <laughs> it's like because like most people don't go to galleries. You know, and and like some like everybody goes once in a while, right? But um, most people it's like don't live in that world and so he's maybe um, wanting to reinvigorate or, or challenge or maybe ask some questions about that gallery space. Uh, next artist that we're looking at, um, Kate Casanova. Uh, Kate Casanova was a, a um, uh, artist from the Twin Cities. Now I think she's out in Colorado. So another person that I, I know a bit. Um, the pieces, these are actually three pieces I think that were from her MFA show. So when she was relatively young, it's like probably eight or ten years ago now. Um, but Kate Casanova, these are actual, actual mushrooms. And so rather than like Roxy Payne creating fabricated or artificial mushrooms, these are the real deal. And so what she would do is she would, you know, find these um, uh, chairs, you know, other upholstered objects, she would seed them, she would create environments, she would seed them with mushrooms, she would create environments in which that could grow, uh, and then allow them to grow. And so one of the pieces that I saw, which I think it might have been this one, when it was in the gallery, it was literally, I believe this is, I believe memory serves me well here, that this was actually like in a plexiglass box that was, you know, sort of moisture on the inside. Um, I love the way that in this one in particular, uh, the way that uh, Kate has has orchestrated it so the mushrooms themselves start to look like the fabric that the uh, you know, that they're being upholstered, uh, the upholstery fabric. Uh, I love the relationship between those two. Uh, and again, there's a very direct relationship. You know, we want to talk about symbiotic relationships. Well, here you go. I mean, this is, uh, you know, a really strong symbiotic relationship, a strong back and forth between, um, you know, the, the upholstery and the, these mushrooms. And there's a visual back and forth. There's a sort of a biological back and forth. And obviously a piece like this is just around for a relatively short time. You know, it's, you know, you, it grows for a while. It's in the gallery space and then it kind of goes away. More recently, uh, oh, by the way, yeah, before we go to the next one, uh, one of the pieces that, I, you know, I thought was a really great piece, but maybe didn't photograph quite as well as these two. Um, she did, she actually had like a car, like her MFA show included a, a, an automobile. It's like a, a GM Pacer, which is kind of this weird looking car uh, that they put out in the 70s and 80s. Um, and she uh, did this to the upholstery in the pacer. And so like literally in the gallery, you could look in the windows of the pacer and you could see like mushrooms sprouting from the upholstery in a, in a whole bunch of places. It was really sort of gorgeous and fun. Uh, and again, I think in a, in a bit of like, a, you know, Hen, Henry Galavier's work, uh, which is a bit about sort of nature fighting back or nature taking back, you could say. Uh, more recently, Kate's work has been, uh, you know, a bit less sort of temporal and organically based and much more about constructing objects, constructing ideas. Um, and a thing that I love about her work is the way that she sort of reaches into every part of the, 
the you know physical environment and so as you're looking here you can see bits of like electrical cable uh, you know fabric uh, you know plastics uh, aluminum things that you would find at Home Depot all just completely assembled into these forms which are sort of these uh, Frankenstein is a bit too strong but these compilations of sort of natural and unnatural uh, all sort of looking flowerish or organic or feeling like um, you know there's something here that that uh, you know, that could grow in an alternate universe, uh, which I think is really fun. Um, but Kate, Kate's work is a lot about these kind of relationships, relationships between sort of natural and artificial uh, and how a person might, um, you know, think about that or, or ways to sort of explore different things related to that. Uh, we're getting close. We've got a f uh, another two or three artists. We'll be wrapping it up here. Leonardo Drew, um, you know, again, uh, if I think about, you know, some of the artists that we're looking at, the relationship between sort of sort of host and or the relationship between two different elements are more obvious, like Kate Casanova's, you know, in those chairs. Uh, Leonardo Drew's is perhaps a bit more symbiotic, excuse, excuse, excuse me, um, symbolic. Um, where the, the pieces, you know, have a sense of sort of weird growth or, um, you know, there, there's a relationship that's perhaps, a, the relationships are perhaps more abstract in nature. Uh, this is sort of a curious piece, one of my favorite Leonardo Drew's piece, but it always has that sort of strange punch in the, in the wallboard behind it in the upper left. And I've never been able to understand or, or, or figure out what that actually is. But every picture that I've seen of this piece has that in it. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, Leonardo Drew, I think, uh, a terrific artist, you know, just really love his work a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I have liked about Leonardo Drew is, is his willingness to manipulate his materials. And he, you know, looking at a piece like this, uh, there's a, a great documentary on him put out by this organization called Art 21 uh, that's well worth uh, a view. And in that, you know, like because his materials all feel like they're a million years old, you know, they're they're dated, they're torn, they're you know, like they're they're aged, and they just look like something that you know was unearthed rather than something that was created. Um, but Leonardo Drew said he always starts with like new material. And uh, he ages things. He sort of manipulates things to get down to these forms. And the phrase that he uses, you know, he says, well, people ask me if I put these out in the weather. It's like, no, man, I, I am the weather. It's like, I'm, I'm the guy. You know, I am the reason that these look like this. And so all of this suddenly becomes much more wonderful in the way that he kind of constructs this. But if we're thinking about sort of symbiotic relationships, um, in like this piece here that we're looking at, for example, you know, there's just a great abstract, you know, and just in terms of like its abstract form, the back and forth between, you know, this, uh, you know, you know, these, these subtler, more refined uh, relief elements on the bottom two thirds, and then this explosive thing that's kind of happening out the top, um, or even this perhaps a, a better one here. Um, you know, to talk about symbiotic relationships. Uh, you know, this one on the left, uh, and this, this one, actually, this is the last image that I have to look at today. Um, but the, the relationship between, you know, the, the parts on the left, which are this hammered aluminum, uh, uh, you know, and then this part on the right, which is sort of this other wood that he has, has aged and, and gotten to this point, the back and forth between these two. Again, it's, you know, the, uh, an artist who is perhaps not, um, really, um, um, let's see, what am I trying to say? An artist who is not necessarily exploring this theme in overt imagery. It's not like he's, he's again, it's not necessarily, you know, rendering the clownfish and the, you know, the sea anemone, but he's doing it in a symbolic sense, and which is certainly one of the approaches that you can take uh, with this project. So, um, a couple other things. Let's see. Uh, so th three things again that, that I would like you to do. Uh, this is not a project that's going to work very well. If you are sitting, finishing this lecture, you maybe have a couple ideas, of, uh, a couple things that you're thinking about, and suddenly you have the light bulb goes off and you say, this is it, I, I'm going to make this thing. And then you rush out and you grab the materials. You know, that's maybe one way to go, but hold that idea loosely. I would say this is 
probably a better project to, you know, read the essay, you know, watch this slide lecture, use your sketch with, make some notes, and then get into the studio with some materials and start exploring what those materials can do. What can you develop? And so what I started to say, you know, a moment ago, this is not necessarily a project that's going to reward um, trying to conceive of the piece beforehand. And I think you have a direct model of how this works in the bronze project that you folks just did. The reason that we did three generations of casting of waxes for that was because you get better each time. You know, it's like you develop into ideas that are much, much stronger. Sometimes, you know, and even thinking about your colleagues in that group, sometimes people were making little jumps from, from one idea to the next. Sometimes they were making bigger jumps from one to the next, but the pieces just kept getting better and better. And so this is perhaps a better model is, um, you know, trying to, you know, work with the material, you know, gather some materials, get some ideas uh, and start experimenting, start playing. So it, the developmental process, the second part of this, I will tell you from experience, the thing that I would say, the thing that trips up people more than any other part of this is that they don't make intentional plans to get materials that are helpful. And so they just grab something from the dorm room. You know, they grab a knickknack off their desk. They grab a book that they don't need anymore. You know, they grab a shoe from, you know, they steal a shoe from their roommate. And it doesn't really have a lot of energy. It doesn't have a lot of impact. And they haven't really thought about it. So what I would say is, you know, be intentional about this. A really cool thing right now is that, um, you know, there's places like Goodwill. There's places like Craigslist or Marketplace Free where you can go like pick stuff up and you can get things. And so I would say, you know, you want to think a bit more. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, final slide. So get some materials, but this is a bigger thing than you think. You know, so get some materials that, that work. And, you know, in the project description, uh, I talk about, you know, uh, it's, you will likely need to, it will be helpful to begin with a larger optic than smaller ones. And you need to think about the expressive and poetic, poetic possibilities of that form. Uh, this is the example that I offer. An object like a pillow, for example, can lead one to ideas that deal with dreams or sleeping or relationships and so on. Uh, and these choices matter. And so you can't just sort of grab a shoe. It's like, yeah, gonna, okay, like I got two shoes I don't need or a boot or, you know, like this leftover thing that I found or this, you know, these three old Coke bottles that I found in the, in the recycling. It's like, you know, try to find something that, that sort of lends itself to manipulation in a bigger way, you know, or, and sometimes that's physically sized and sometimes it's just more evocative, you know, things that can have potential for you. And be intentional about this don't just grab the thing that's close, but try to find something that has some energy or can move into other kinds of ideas. Uh, you know, and I'm happy to talk about that. Um, the other thing I would say about this, you know, you know not only is ex your early choices about some of your object are going to be really be helpful. You know, if, like if you are making quick and easy choices, that's probably a way to, um, to not be very successful with the project. But, um, you know, be, be a bit thoughtful and try to find some things that, that uh, you know, um, lean towards the potential of transformation. Another thing I would say that uh, craft and visual development and intensity matter a lot. It can really help you uh, in this. This is really one about craft and intensity and helpful, you know, that would be helpful. Uh, other things that you could think about too, uh, you know, we I did a demo with, um, you know, some of the, uh, rubber mold stuff. It wasn't terribly successful. I'm happy to do a better demonstration of that. We can get a better product. I can do a better demonstration of that. But if we were thinking about, <coughs> excuse me, you know, there's certain forms there where it wouldn't actually be that hard to cast like a lot of plaster elements, you know, especially if they were smaller, uh, wouldn't be that hard to cast a lot of things. And so you have the potential to make things as well. We have a laser cutter uh, that you can cut things out as well. So we have some other potentials that can add uh, elements to this. So um, be thinking about that. So we're about an hour at the point at which I'd like to, to stop. Um, I will be, you know, we'll be communicating more about timeline. That's all I really have to say about this project. But, uh, you know, make the piece that scares you a little bit. You know, that's what I would say. That's what I always do. Make the piece that's a little terrifying. You know, the one that it's like, wow, can I really do that? It's like, yeah, like you can. 
And uh, I think that sort of based on the, the success of people's development of the wax projects for the bronze casting, super excited about, you know, the potential for what you folks are going to do with this one. So, Okay, go kill them. Have fun.